I graduated from the George School, which is a private uh, coeducational prep school in Philadelphia, in 1958 and went into the military. After going through uh, advanced infantry training, I was transferred to the Pentagon, where I worked for the Radio Frequency Engineering Office. I finished there, and then I joined the White House Army Signal Agency in May of 1959. Uh, I served under Eisenhower uh, from May of 1959 until he got out of office, and then I served under Kennedy until uh, I left the service in August of 1961. I worked with a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Holloman, <clears throat> and I can't think of his first name other than the fact that I think it may be Earl, but I can't I, I can't swear to it. Anyway, uh, my job was to, uh, was to learn how to deal with code, and that's what I did. And when the process of, of dealing with that uh, through military uh, maneuvers, uh, I uh, learned a lot about Project Blue Book. Uh, Blue Book was discussed quite openly in the office. Uh, sections of Blue Book were open for discussion. and. Uh, then there were other matters as well that, that were brought to uh, our attention one afternoon when, when we uh, were just about ready to finish up training. It was about 3.30, maybe quarter or four in the afternoon. Uh, Colonel Hollibird brought out <coughs> a piece of, of what appeared to be uh, a metallic, uh, it was a metallic piece of Looked like about a looked like a yardstick. Um, it uh, it had uh, deciphering. It had uh, it had encryption on it, and uh, the encryption was pointed out by Colonel Hollibird uh, to each one of us who were in the uh, in that class, and I think there were six or seven of us at that time. And uh, it was uh, told to us where that came from, and this was in. In uh, connection with Operation Blue Book, what they were trying to say is, look, we've, we've got this, this physical information, this physical uh, property, and to, to go along with what, what you've seen in Blue Book, we have now been able to get our hands on and show you uh, materially, and that's what, that's what he did. They went on to further explain that, that this was the material that had come from uh, the New Mexico crash in 1947, and um, <clears throat> that was discussed. Um, I think it was discussed at length, if I'm not mistaken. We, we spent perhaps another hour or so. We left about an hour late that afternoon, and, and the next day it was discussed again. They did discuss the fact that there were bodies. Extraterrestrial. Uh, extraterrestrial bodies, yes. Um, there were either three or five, and, and, and they didn't even know at that point uh, because some of, the, uh, some of the information that they had gotten apparently was, was incomplete, but three or five stands out in my mind as, as the number that, uh, that were taken. Uh, they were, one was alive, uh, partially alive at the time that uh, this happened, and I do not know what may have happened to him after that. Um, but uh, the Army Air Force uh, was, or the Air Force at that time, was very, very much concerned about Blue Book. And there were strict uh, regulations involving anything that had to do with the reporting of a UFO uh, or uh, talking about a UFO. If you wanted to ruin your career, and it was told to us, and I was an enlisted man, I was the lowest, the lowest thing. Uh, down on the totem pole, and, and it was made clear to us that if we wanted to mess up our career, uh, the thing that we could do the fastest was to talk about UFOs, <coughs> that we were being groomed for top secret and above, and that, um, and that we, uh, we certainly would not be cleared for any kind of, of confidential material should this be released. Uh, you saw an awful lot. You saw a lot of little pictures. Um, most of the pictures we have seen duplicates of today. Uh, some were, the pictures that I saw were, I think, uh, maybe uh, a little bit better 
Uh, they were taken by uh, Air Force pilots, as well pictures of, uh, of the UFOs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they actually had pictures of UFOs in these. Oh, places. indeed, they did. Yes, not only the Air Force, but but uh, some were taken by civilian pilots. Uh, some were taken by uh, uh, Marine Air Corps uh, pilots. Uh, and, and some were foreign. And it was uh, it was made quite clear that 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 there were a number of others that uh, that were in place in other agencies that were being used at that time that were not being put in the blue book. I inferred from that that perhaps those pictures were better than the pictures that they were showing us. It was kind of grayish foil-like, uh, maybe eight to ten inches long. I can't remember. Uh, it seemed giant-like when I saw it because it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this before. And, and all eyes uh, were, were just peeled on that particular thing. And when he told us what it was, it, uh, uh, it was frightening. It was eerie there. You could have heard a pin drop in the room when, when it was first mentioned. And what did he tell you it was? Well, he said it would, had been taken from one of the craft that had uh, crashed in, uh, in New Mexico. And that it had been taken from a box of materials that the military was working on. And uh, they didn't use the word uh, reverse engineering at that time, but the, it was some, something similar to the reverse engineering uh, that they felt like uh, uh, they, uh, they needed to work on, and it was going to take years to do this. Uh, I do remember that there was, uh, that at the, uh, uh, at the Army Engineers uh, Fort Belvoir, that, that, uh, uh, that they were doing a lot of experimentation at Fort Belvoir, and that surprised me. It, it, it surprised me an awful lot. Well, they look like hieroglyphics. Um, it's hard to describe hieroglyphics, but, but um, if you've ever seen any ancient Egyptian writings, you, you know that, um, uh, that the, the hieroglyphics were animated in some form, and these, these appeared to be animated. And if I knew you know, the code that was supposed to be used to, to find out how this language was to be interpreted, then I, it, it was very expressive. You could tell it was expressive. He had a stainless steel box with a lock on it, um, almost like a carpenter's box, but maybe bigger. And that's where he got this from. And that's where he put it back. And I gathered that was not the only thing that was in that box. Uh, but that's the only thing he did show. I were, this was in the radio frequency engineering office. I did not have any more contact with with uh, the subject matter of UFOs until after I came in contact with the president. And uh, then I had heard that he did an awful lot of doodling on paper, on uh, notebook paper, particularly at conferences that he wasn't particularly happy with. And he would take to doodling, and one of the things that he did, he did doodle, uh, were uh, various forms of UFOs. Now, you're referring to him now? President Eisenhower. Okay. Yeah. I never saw Kennedy do this, but President Eisenhower did it, and he did it in my presence, as well as several other people who, who were uh, attached to the White House Army Signal Agency. We had one instructor, a lieutenant colonel, and his, his um, I guess his job was to not only teach us, but to make us believers as well. And uh, that's that's when he produced that piece of material from the, what appeared to be stainless steel box. It was a, maybe a, a kind of a dusty gray-like uh, foil that may have been burned on, looked like it may have been burned on a, on a grill. Um, it was made clear that he, that that, it was inferred that that was not the only piece of information that he had, or that the only, the only object that he had, and he had several others. Maybe the whole box was filled, I don't know. But that's the only piece he filled out, and it, we, the reason he did this was, was to make sure that we understood we were dealing with something that, that was totally out of context from, 
from what we have been dealing with earlier and but that we might be dealing with in the future. And I think he intended for us to know that, that our futures were going to be dealing with this subject matter more and more. He did it, describe them as being symbols of, of, uh, of instruction. And that's as far as he would go, but, but he, did in, he did infer that, that, that the instructions, whatever they might have been, uh, were something that, uh, that uh, was important enough for the military to, uh, to keep working on on a, on a constant basis. Uh, it, he made it quite clear that, that this was something that was of grave importance. But we were in the basement of the Pentagon, and in those days, that was in 1959, uh, there was a tremendous amount of security there in the base of the Pentagon. Anybody who's worked there knows what I'm talking about. Uh, you could almost carry on an entire war in the basement and no one else would know uh, what was going on in the floors above. So that's how secure it was. I was working on top secret. I had gotten a secret and by the time I finished the school, I uh, had been given a top secret, but I was to, given, I was to be given one step higher than that. And, uh, and at that time, they didn't have a clearance specifically dealing with this problem. If you dealt with a problem, you got a Q clearance, which was, which was a nuclear clearance. Um, and maybe later on, they decided they were going to change that, but that, I remember that that was the big question. How are we going to, to give security uh, to... Uh, our security clearances to these people who have been through this course. There were probably 1,500 reported cases at that time that were, I guess you'd say, eligible to be printed or to be put in Blue Book. And the, the, uh, the findings that were put in there were highly scientific, uh, and they were highly gone over uh, by, by uh, the people that, uh, that knew it knew what they wanted to put in there. Um, now this information was information that would never get out to, uh, <clears throat> to anyone else, but it was designed for the use of, of particular military personnel. And so what was there was, was extremely exact and specific. These cases were as bona fide as they possibly could be. They were talking about people who who had uh, sterling reputations either in the military or either in maybe a civilian capacity in some form or another, but, but they were not taking any loose cannons. This was, this, this was information that was, uh, it was they, they thought was extremely uh, uh, accurate. In this country during the early 50s, uh, numerous bases were built where that would allow the president and Congress and VIPs to go in case of, of, uh, of attack. Uh, that is to maintain the government on its, uh, on its level of being able to function and so forth. And Mount, Mount Weather, Virginia was, uh, was one of those. Uh, Fort Ritchie, Maryland was another, Camp David, uh, uh, Maryland and the Catoctin Mountains was another, and uh, there was another one in West Virginia at that time, which we only knew as uh, uh, as concrete. <laughs> that was the code name. Uh, Mount Weather, for example, is 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 underground. It is uh, uh, it is designed specifically to. Uh, uh, to be impenetrable as far as then uh, what we knew about uh, atomic weaponry was concerned. Uh, but also, uh, there was equipment up there, and it was specifically told to me when, uh, when I first came there. I first went on tour there, because we, we had to go through all these places where the president would go just to familiarize ourselves on what to do and, and how to do it. But there, there was equipment up there to, to deal specifically with with a UFO problem. Now, it was a standard, uh, op it was a standard, op there was a standard operating instruction. And I don't know what it was. Um, that would have been out of my, uh, out of my category of work, but, 
but there was a standard operating instruction on what to do uh, with U UFOs had been sighted around Mount Weather. Uh, not only on one or two occasions, but on numerous occasions, from what I understand. Uh, they also have been sighted uh, in West Virginia, uh, at the place I referred to as, uh, as concrete. Stories about radar lock-on. Yes, there were, and, and the, several of those stories came out of Ohio. Uh, there was Wright, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, but uh, several others came from California, uh, Texas, uh, Washington, from what I can recall, but I would say there probably were between two and three hundred cases of lock-on, and that's why those cases were in there, uh, because they were authentic. Did I ever hear that we had ever picked up signals which, uh, which could not be identified, or but if they could be identified, uh, were they coming in from strange craft um, that, uh, that perhaps had given us uh, uh, or put us under surveillance, and yes, I, I did hear that, and I, I heard that from uh, numerous, I wouldn't say numerous, but at least five, maybe six reports that wound up in Blue Book. Yeah. And these, uh, in fact, several of the, of the uh, reports had come in through pilots' radios. Um, <laughs> when they, in the, uh, so, Whatever intelligence we were dealing with at that time knew how to deal with us. They knew how to communicate with us. But that they were of extraterrestrial origin, that was the belief. I was told that what they had there for us to deal with came from the New Mexico site. But there were other sites and there were other crashes. They did not say where. Uh, they were not pinpointed, but, but uh, it was made quite clear that that was not the only site that they had gathered information from and, uh, and also materiel. The Wright-Patterson the Wright, Wright Air Force Base uh, was brought up uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, that apparently there were more lock-ons at Wright-Patterson than at any other Air Force Base. Edwards Air Force Base was mentioned uh, as, as uh, uh, an experimental station. And when I, when I say mentioned in that context, I, I knew that it was, it was uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in the area of testing whatever they had found. Uh, it was said that that's what was being done. Uh, Lock-ons had come from Edwards Air Force Base. I found that in Operation Blue Book. I was there at the same time that Philip Corso was there. I, when I first came to work for the president, uh, I didn't meet him until probably a month and a half after I'd been on board. Um, and at that time, it was, a, it was a very formal meeting. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Right after that, I got an opportunity to travel a little bit with the president. Uh, we, uh, we did some traveling towards Florida. Uh, he loved to play golf. And I had an opportunity to see him under fire, as it were, and, and how he would handle uh, certain people that he didn't like. And when he did that, he would doodle. <laughs> he was probably one of the world's best doodlers, and everybody would kid him. Uh, I wouldn't, I wasn't in a position to do so, but, but the higher officers would, would kind of say little things every now and then. And uh, he, uh, he just would smile and he'd keep on doodling. Well, on some, of those, on some of those occasions, he had just been given messages or just been given information uh, pertaining to sightings or pertaining to information about UFOs. And I know that for a fact because I was in the comm center. And uh, I saw that information, and when he would do it, uh, it would excite him beyond. He was just a, he was just a kid, I mean, and he would, he would uh, get so, he would get so excited and give orders like, uh, like uh, D-Day was was happening all over again. He was very, very uh, interested in shapes and sizes, and and. Uh, and what, uh, what made him go, I know that. 
The White House itself has a huge comm center in the basement. It's run by the Air Force, but the Army's there. Every place where the president would go, including Camp David, has, has a comm center that, um, that deals specifically with, with uh, presidential traffic. Uh, the president would, would continually, on, a, on an afternoon or an evening, would continually get fed information and it wouldn't be coming from me, it would be coming usually from, from a warrant officer. Why, well, I'm not sure how that works, but, but that's the way it worked at that time. Usually it was from a warrant officer, so a chief warrant officer who had been in the Army for probably 30 years or more. <laughs> and when he would get that information, um, he sometimes would, uh, would close himself off, and he would be alone for a while, and then he would call in whoever he needed to call in. But dealing specifically with UFOs, I can only remember on one or two occasions where, where that information came directly from the comm center to him. Uh, most of the time it seemed to come, it was indirect. Most of that material, when it's passed through, it's for, it's for eyes only. And that means that if you have a direct interest in it, then you'll see it. If you don't, then you won't. You knew that there were sightings you knew that there were new findings. If you'd been around the president long enough, you could just judge by his expressions what he was, uh, what he was reading and, and what interested him. I mean, it's just something you, you knew from, from being around him. I would say that probably that was among his highest uh, of interest at that time. Yes, indeed. It happened quite frequently. And I wouldn't dare say how many times, but sure. it happened frequently. What happened was uh, not one particular agency could handle uh, dealing with, with the entire subject matter, uh, dealing from the engineering portion uh, to, uh, uh, to citing information, to uh, reporting it in the Blue Book. The whole process of dealing with, with, uh, with the UFO f uh, phenomenon uh, could not be handled anymore by one agency. And so in order to keep it alive, and I guess as cheaply as possible, it was, it was given to various and sundry parts of the government to work on. And I guess they thought that they could, they could also keep the intelligence uh, factor as, uh, as secret as possible by, by giving little ag agencies a little bit here and a little bit there and that oftentimes is done with, with matters like this. But, but what happened was Eisenhower got sold out. Uh, the, without him knowing it, uh, he lost control of, of, uh, of what was going on with, with uh, the entire, I think, with the entire UFO situation. But I think he was telling us the military industrial complex will stick you in the back uh, if, if you are not totally vigilant. And um, I think he felt like he had not been vigilant. I think he felt like he trusted too many people. And, uh, and Eisenhower was a trusting man. He was a good man. Um, and I think, uh, I think that he realized that all of a sudden this, this, this matter is, is going into, uh, into the control of corporations uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, could very well be uh, used uh, in, uh, in detriment to this country. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. I think the, the frustration from what I can remember went on for months. Um, he uh, he uh, realized that he was losing control he realized that this, this, the phenomenon of, of, uh, of whatever it was that, uh, that we were faced with uh, was not going to be in the best hands. And that, that, those were the, as far as I can remember, that was the expression that was used. It's not going to be in the best hands. Um, that was a real concern. And so it has turned out to be. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. 
I would say that the government has done a, as good a job through the installation of abject fear, as good a job on this as they've done with anything uh, with, uh, within the time of the memory of modern man. I really believe they've done a job. It had been discussed with me on numerous occasions. Um, talked about what could happen uh, to me uh, militarily and, and what could happen to me if I, even if I discuss this as a civilian. He discussed with me uh, what possibly could happen should there be a revelation. Is that what your question was? And um, he was talking about being erased. And I said, man, I said, what do you mean, erased? He said, yes. He said, you will be erased. I said, how do you know all this? Or something to that effect. And, and he said, I know. He said, those threats have been made and carried out. He said, those threats started uh, way back in 1947. Uh, the Army was given, uh, or the Air Force, excuse me, was given the uh, uh, absolute control over how to handle this, this being the biggest, um, the biggest security situation that, uh, that this country has ever dealt with. And uh, there have been some erasures. He was very convincing and when, he, when he said this, and he was in a position to know. Uh, he, was, uh, he was much older than I, and uh, he had been involved with, uh, uh, with the CIA and, and the DIA both. And, uh, well, then it wasn't DIA, but he was, he was involved with the CIA. And so I, I, he knew what he was talking about. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't just kidding. So I guess fear has done it. I don't care what kind of a person you are. I don't care how strong or courageous you are. It would be a very fearful situation because they, from what Matt said, he said, they'll, uh, he said, they'll go after not only you, he said, they'll go after your family. Now, those were his words. And so I can only say that the reason they've been managed to keep it under wraps for so long is through, is through fear. They are very selective about how they pull someone out to make an example of. And, uh, and I know that's been done. You can't create anything positively through fear. Fear, fear only degenerates uh, the human soul and the human psyche, um, the human mind, if you will. And, uh, and that, that will eventually go away. We have gotten so much momentum with the secrecy that has shrouded this subject matter that we're liable to wind up in a big fat crash. Um, I don't think that collectively we are able, at least as far as I've been able to determine, and that's, granted I'm not privy to, to the things that uh, that uh, I would like to be privy to, but, but as I see it, when, when you propagate a lie and propagate a fear of, of the truth, you put yourself in a very vulnerable position. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time, so evidently they've, they've known how to do it. But at some point in time, uh, because of the interest I think that the media has taken. There will be people coming out speaking that have never thought about speaking before, particularly about Nellis uh, and what's been going on there. <laughs> think because what would be revealed would totally destroy uh, uh, an economy that uh, was designed by certain uh, capitalists in this country uh, a long, long time ago to maintain them and, and their corporations uh, from here to eternity. And I think that uh, I think oil has a special interest in seeing that it maintains its position where it is regardless of what kind of pollution, uh, regardless of, 
of what uh, disastrous side effects may, may have occurred and continue to occur. I think, I think that, that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with certain electromagnetic devices that, uh, that uh, uh, are powered by, uh, by sources that we, that we just don't quite understand as of yet. Well, we're certainly not advertising them anyway but that these sources would, uh, would mean free power. And free power is something that, that uh, corporations panic about. And I think this government panics about it. You know, how are you going to tax free power? Looking at it from a, from a governmental point of view. And from everyone that I've talked to uh, who knows something about this subject matter, uh, they do believe that, that uh, the sources of energy that keep these vehicles in propulsion uh, are sources of energy that, that are just as free as free can be. And they don't cause any harm to the environment. They don't cause uh, any footprints to be left anywhere. Uh, given, uh, given the fact that we're having a real question about how to deal with uh, the high price of Arab oil right now, uh, Bush is, is uh, as you know, is trying to insist that we go into some of the Arctic regions and, and take more oil out. Uh, I, for one, don't see that as, a, as an answer. I think, that would, I think that would be totally, with the situation, with, 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 uh, with the global warming situation being what it is, uh, that would just be another, it would just be another nail in our coffin. Uh, but at some point in time, and I don't know when that will be, but at some point in time, uh, we are going to have to be faced with, with the sharing of this information that will allow us uh, to have uh, free energy, if you will. A graduate student in college dealing with, with physics understands that, that there are certain curves where where this, this uh, speed factor does not mean a thing, uh, that it's certain curves fa curve factors in space, um, that time and space uh, take on a totally new dimension. Uh, the government knows this. this, this it's foolish for them to try to make uh, the rest of us look like imbeciles and saying that this can't happen. Well, it can happen. I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind, and I was 99, 9 tenths percent sure that the Russians didn't have any of that type either. So it certainly, there were certainly was, at that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And 